Hello and welcome back to this special episode of the podcast series that we're doing from the Financial Planning Association Conference. I am joined by Matt Jones. Thank you for joining me, Matt. Great to be with you, Fraser. Now tell the listeners about your claim to fame. Well, I think the one you're referring to, well, probably my only one, frankly, has been co-founder of Four Pillars Gin. If I sound out of breath at the moment, it's also because we're sitting in the middle of the Four Pillars Bar and we have been smashed for the last 90 minutes nonstop. So. Yeah, that this has been an amazing experience for those people who weren't here. You have actually been creating cocktails or creating a drink for us to all have a, 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 a sip at, uh, behind the t- on the tools, I would say. I made the huge mistake of ending my presentation with a live cocktail demonstration on stage which seems to have attracted quite a lot of people to have that cocktail as that well. That is so not a huge mistake by any learned. means <laughs> so for somebody who has just sampled the, uh, the goods. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, Ten years. Ten years of Four Pillars? Yeah, look, we're ten years of playing with Four Pillars. We, we turn nine in terms of our time on the market on the 4th of December. It was 4th of December 2013 that we launched, but we were toying with it from, I guess, sort of mid-2012, got serious towards the end of 2012, Early 2013, we send my two co-founders, Stu and Cam, off on a little fact-finding mission and really, you know, put some money in the bank, put an order down on a still and, you know, things get serious. Yeah, things do get serious. And uh, and I think probably from a, a point of view, you're entering a marketplace where there wasn't a lot of boutique gin distilleries around in Australia? Look, there were there were fewer than 20 gin distilleries and, and the majority were probably distilleries that made other things including gin so maybe a rum distillery here a whiskey distillery in tasmania so there were there were a few different gin labels there wasn't really an australian gin scene what there was was a a, a new craft gin movement happening overseas hadn't happened here really yet and frankly there probably wasn't much demand for it to happen here yet so there was you had to be very realistic about we think there's exciting possibility, but it's not exactly, you know, pent up demand that's just waiting for someone to bring Australian gin to the market. Yeah, this is what the Henry Ford says. If you ask people what they want, they're going to ask you for uh, faster horses or... Yeah, and, and I don't think anyone was going to say at that stage, a great Australian gin. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, that wasn't on the cards. Um, tell us a little bit about that process, though, because you had to uh, work through, and as it, from a business point of view, obviously we're talking about gin, but we're talking about a business, right? And a business where the market doesn't exist. So, well... The, the, the craft, I guess the, the high quality gin market existed, but the craft market didn't? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the high quality gin market was definitely there. It was dominated by Hendrix. There was a much bigger, sort of rather tired old gin market, classic London dry gins. Um, the craft gin scene was definitely growing in the US, it was growing in the UK. And, and I think how you go about building a business, it, it, there's obviously no one right answer. And if you have an impatient desire and need to achieve growth, you can perhaps approach it in one way. We were fortunate in Four Pillars in that we, from the outset, we we wanted to play the long game and play the quality game. And we, we really challenged ourselves to see what would happen if we made something to an exceptional standard where we place craft at the center. And I remember having a conversation very early on with Stu and Cam, my co-founders saying, look, we're gonna be a craft business And craft has no scale limit. There'll be people who will tell us that craft means small and therefore after a certain size, you're not craft anymore. We say, well, it's not that. Craft is just a total commitment to quality. And in theory, you can be a global brand. And there are great examples of global brands that retain that sense of quality at the heart. They're just rare. And more commonly, you see these big brands where quality is perhaps being pushed to one side a little bit. So I don't think our business model is right for everyone. We really prioritized product quality and we, we took it slow and you know members of the FPA will be interested that we we put enough money aside in the bank to make sure that we didn't have to get impatient for short-term returns and start running sales promotions because that way lies a very short-termist approach to building a brand but instead we we really sort of prioritize getting the product right packaging the product right getting all those cues of quality and excellence and then over time seeing where can that take us? Yeah, I, I want to harp on this craft idea a little bit longer because craft um, can mean you know small and boutique and, and, and doing things, but then to scale craft is a whole new story. But but I think what you focus on was mastering the craft. Look, I think so. I, something I, I I often say: the world doesn't need another anything. The world needs a better something. There's always a market for a better something, and I think your craft is your 
opportunity to unlock what it is that you can do or make better. It doesn't have to be everything. It, it might be that you're running a, a financial advisory practice that's just exceptional at client experience, or you're running a financial advisory practice that's just exceptional at dealing with older people who've not prepared for their retirement and now they're in the middle of it, and that's what you're really good at. Your craft is, is that deep mastery, as you say, of the thing that's then going to unlock your opportunity to add value. I think what that can then happen to a lot of businesses as they grow, they start to realize that some of those things that drove their craft are expensive and maybe there are easier paths, but that doesn't mean they're better paths. And probably in the long run, that's going to dilute the craft and dilute the mastery and dilute the value. So I think there is a, a hard road to growth, which is holding on to the craft, but ultimately it's surely got to be a more rewarding road to growth. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um and certainly sampling the beverages tonight, there's definitely a re- reward at the end of it. Um, but before we go there, you're, you presented today. You had a presentation on stage, a keynote to finish the day. Yep. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I enjoy speaking and I get to do it a fair bit. And, and I always see it as my job to hopefully tell a success story because I think Four Pillars is absolutely a work in progress. But it's a really fun one and we've got some runs on the board. And it's nice to be able to share that and say, look what Australia can do. But I also see it as my job to connect some of the, 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 the lessons that we've learned, the principles we've followed, and, and, and help other organizations and other people connect with them. Because at the end of the day, most of us are not making gin, we're not making cocktails, we're, we're, but we are creating something, and that something needs to be wrapped in great storytelling and great experiences if we're going to make the most of it. So that's what I, I chatted about today, the, 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 the dual challenge of really mastering your craft but then recognizing that that alone is not enough. That if you don't then really do justice to the value you create in the stories you tell and the experiences you provide to your clients, then you're leaving value on the table. You're leaving it to chance that your clients will tell the story you wish they would tell about you. And we'll take responsibility for that. Tell them the story and give them experiences that make it almost non-negotiable that they'll go away and they'll 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 preach the gospel of, of your business and, and the experience that they have with you. So that was the I guess the, the, the lessons I hope that people took from, from today. Yeah, as, as business there's very much those as you said, those principles uh, across different businesses and, and, and whether they're a financial advice business or, or a gin distillery, um, a lot to learn in, this, in, the, in that space. Tell us a little bit about some of those principles. We talked about things like sandwiches and peacocks and all these sort of Look, things yeah, in the presentation. I'm, so I had a bit of a, a strange route into gin that, that started as an economist, um, moved into politics and ended up in the, in the brand space. And the, the, the the part of the brand world that I was in was, was this sort of emerging world of brand experience agencies. And it was a really interesting time. I, I, I entered that world in 2006. So if you cast your mind back, and you and I are probably just about old enough to remember the digital world then, we're really, we're pre-social media. Facebook technically launched in 2004. Most of us got accounts 2010, 2011. The iPhone only launched in 2007. It took a while for 3G to catch up and put social media in your pocket. So working in the brand experience space in 2006 through to 2012, and fortunately it took me to New York for a little while, we were really at a time when businesses were realizing that the experiences they created would be talked about by so many more people and, and put in the sort of the social media shop window by their customers. And what I've spent a lot of time thinking about then is, well, what are the types of experiences that change how people talk about you, that change how people behave? And Sandwiches and Peacocks is a simple way that I've used over the years to articulate two, if you like, mental models. The, the sandwich model is all about how can you become easier to do business with, easier to buy, easier to, um, to continue to, to transact with, easier to roll over. And you see it from Amazon to Netflix to to Uber, these businesses that are just trying to eliminate friction because they recognize if they've got you as a customer and they can eliminate friction, you're never going to leave. So if we think as businesses, where are the points of friction, pain, annoyance for our clients? How can we sand them away and smooth them down? That's sandwich thinking. The challenge is your, your competitors are probably seeing the same things as you. They're seeing the same pain points and technology is making it easier and easier for people to eliminate pain points. So you know, Four Pillars, we've just invested in a super fancy new customer experience solution that means we can get back to more people with their inquiries faster. Five years ago, that would cost us millions of dollars of tech stack investment. And today it's an off the shelf solution and it's in the low tens of thousands. So sandwich thinking is important, but it's easy to replicate, which is where the peacock comes in. The peacock is my 
analogy for being colorful and noisy and memorable. And I think every brand, I mean, I think about accounting, zero. You know, did anyone think that accounting software needed to get sexy? But zero went, well, wait a minute, people who do the books and do the accounts and look at software every day, they'd rather look at something beautifully designed. And they've really carved out a niche there. And I think there's room for design, aesthetics, beauty, storytelling to make all of us feel something in any business. And so that's that real encouragement not to... It's not that you shouldn't be focused on quality because as we discussed, it's critical, but don't overestimate how rational people are. Remember, we respond to emotion. We respond to story. We're hardwired that way. And so where can that show up, those peacock moments in your business, and where can you create value through that way of thinking as well? Yeah, I I 100% agree about the the people make those emotional decisions and those are the things that those memorable moments that you create in the business are so important for uh, from consumers to be able to share with others about, you know, not the technical stuff, um, especially in financial advice. Uh, it's about those magical moments that they go, I felt something. And, and often it's the, the two are actually complementary. You know, so I, I think about why at Four Pillars I've always cared so much about design, photography, packaging, labels. And it's because all of those things give our customers a hint of how much we care about quality and attention to detail. And if I could force them to, to watch Cameron distill a batch of gin for eight hours, they would get it. But I can't do that. And so how do I give them little cues? How do I drop little breadcrumbs to say, look how much we care? It's the same in, in the financial planning space. If, if we want to be trusted, trust is a feeling. If we want to give our clients confidence that we've got their backs, how do we convey confidence in the typefaces we choose, in the clarity with which we convey information. So the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. We think about what what's the craft we want to be known for? What's the trust we want to be built? What do we want to be trusted at? And then how do we use things like design or environmental design? If we bring someone in for a financial planning conversation and we know we're going to ask them questions about their children and their ambitions and their retirement, how do we create a, a waiting room space that gets people thinking about the right things with the right visual cues, the right environment, the right coffee. I mean, it might sound trivial, but taking care of those details. That's why Apple stores are such incredible places where you and I are happy to spend far more money on a P- on a laptop than we had to spend on the equivalent PC because Apple gives us a feeling of trust and confidence in the hardware and the ecosystem. So, yeah, I, I think that stuff is critical and it's not, it's not sort of saying craft is not important to say that also those experiences are really important. Yeah, then one of the things I love about your presentation was we did talk about the, the, the sandwiches and, and the peacocks and they were all important, but they always linked back to the core values of, of that you put down in the, at the beginning. Yeah, so look, I mean, I think it gets easier to do all of that when you know why you're doing it. And, you know, we've all heard Simon Sinek talk about start with why. And there's lots of different theories out there about what your purpose should be. Some people would say, oh, purpose is all about bigger picture, social, higher purpose. How is your business helping to save the world? For me, it's more just about giving yourselves decision-making tools to go, why does our business exist? And why, why will it grow? Why will it succeed? Why will we be valued by our clients? So for Four Pillars, it's all about taking the opportunity that is given to us of making gin in Australia. And that has led us to go, well, if we exist to elevate the craft of distilling gin because we're here in Australia, it helps us decide not to make vodka, not to make whiskey. Because if if our job is to elevate gin making, then it's probably not to get up one day and go, oh, we've done gin now, let's make something else. But then it also helps you with so many other decisions and investments because fundamentally you've got that clarity of why you exist and why you matter and why you're doing this. Yeah, fantastic. Now, 10 years on from making gin, we also covered up some of the other stuff around sustainability, around the fact that you you know reuse the oranges that come out of yep. the, uh, the vats to make marmalade, all these sorts of things. But that's that's then also evolved in some other stuff within your business. Look, it has. And, and there's always been this sense of never compromise, never compromise on the fundamental quality of the gin. And that meant that in the early days, our sustainability efforts were always about what can we do on the margin? So can we put solar on our roof? Yes. Can we be smart with our water usage? Can we, can we take the, the water that gets heated from our stills and use it to heat the distillery in winter? Absolutely. So let's be smart. And can we take the oranges and the botanicals and turn them into marmalade and salt and chocolate? Absolutely. The game changer, though, was in developing our, our growing distillery. We, we effectively developed the site next door to double the size of it. Um, that's more Christmas gin drinks being delivered. Yeah, yep. um, very happily. And, um, 
there we were able to make some really big decisions on sustainability. We've wrapped the whole site in this incredible copper fence, a copper veil, which is effectively a close to two kilometre passive water cooling chimney that is saving tens of thousands of litres of water every day. So we've been able to make big decisions, partly because we've got a bit more money in our pockets, partly because we can start with a blank canvas. But the critical thing is always, what can we do that's the right thing to do while not compromising the core craft? And one more thing, every investment we make in that space, we try and get a return from it in terms of storytelling. So the first thing we did after completing those things and we, we got certified carbon neutral, we won this incredible accolade at the International Wine and Spirits Competition in London to win their, their inaugural Green Spirits Initiative Trophy. Immediately, we got a camera crew out there with a filmmaker that we love and said, right, make the film of what we've done because we need to tell people about this because it's only when we get the credit for it, we're not going to distort it. We're going to tell the truth of what we've done, but it's our job. We've done this thing. It's valuable. Let's now get the get the, the the return from that, and I think that's maybe the the critical piece that brings it all together. Absolutely, when you've got a good story to tell, you should definitely get out there and start telling. And I think financial advisors are in that definitely that space as well. Matt Jones, thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, and and for being here at the FBA Congress in Sydney. Uh, I know you've had to travel to be here, and I appreciate you being some time away from your family. Um, thank you so much for for uh, sharing with us all your your w- words of wisdom. Absolutely, and look me up on LinkedIn, Matt Jones Four Pillars Gin, and. Um, Always happy to connect and thrilled to be here. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this our special podcast series brought to you by XY and the FPA coming to you from the Financial Planning Association Conference in Sydney. Uh, I'm joined again this morning by Danny. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Fraser. We are day two. We are halfway through an amazing sharing of ideas at the FPA's 30th birthday. Yeah, fantastic. And we've got our first podcast victim at the podcast bar. (laughs) Thanks for kicking things off, Paul. My pleasure. Great to be here. So, Paul, you spoke yesterday. Yep. So, it would be, we've just learned in the small amount of time that we've spoken with you before the podcast that you're a bit of an overachiever. (laughs) You like to do a lot of things. Would you, before we get into your session and what that covered, would you mind telling the listeners a bit about you? You know, how you built an advice business and obviously a technology business as well. Yeah. And got in a thesis in there as well. There were three main big things that we're going to cover in this podcast. Yeah. Um, look, I guess um, if, I, if I go right back to not the very start, but a long way back, uh, in a previous life, I was, I was an ambulance paramedic for about a decade um, in the 80s, 90s. And, and um, the thing I realized, I, I worked as a country ambo for, for a few years and... and uh, I keep hearing this phrase all the way th- through my, my career, which, which was whenever you arrived at, no matter what you arrived at, people would say, oh, it's okay, the ambulance is here now. It didn't matter what was happening, how terrible, what amount of you know, crap was going on, <laughs> the ambulance is here now, it's okay. Right? And, and I took from that that, that what they were saying is, uh, I don't know what to do, I'm in chaos. Right? And so someone here knows what to do. They've got the uniform on, they know what to do. This idea of chaos to calm became sort of a mantra for our practice that we started. It's our, it's our practice motto. Um, so when cl- clients come and see financial advisors, I think they come in in a chaotic situation, panicking, worried, upset, don't know what they're going to do, fearful. And so our job is to know what to do. And I think that's the job of a financial planner is to know what to do, right? So we've m- made that motto. Um, so it's around kind of... Um, Does that mean we can call financial planners first responders now? Is that, I think is that absolutely. Is this official? You've, absolutely. You've, you've tagged it? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And the first first responder, first podcaster. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And you started that 25 years ago, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think the job's very similar. Um, I think we, there are, there's a process we go through. Right? Pro- all financial planners should go through a similar process, maybe in different different ways, but there's a process that they go through. Getting to know the client first, understanding that, and then working out what strategy they should be doing, we'll get what the gaps are, and then following a format, a, a process, a, a approach, um, just like Ambos do. And so, so consequently, that led me much later <laughs> into the idea of um, getting the client information much more accurately, much more efficiently, so we've got somewhere to go. So hence, we started the software business called iPackMine about four, four and a half years ago. Yeah, you decided to start uh, while well, you were doing a whole lot of other things at the same time, though, you're in the middle of a thesis. Yeah. Uh, tell us about, uh, about how, how you love the hectic life. <laughs> oh, look, I, lo- I love education. So I've got a couple of master's degrees and a couple of degrees, and um, you know, I just really wanted to take that last step and, and get a thesis. So I, I did a, a master's in tax and master's in financial planning at Uni of New South Wales, um, in about 2009, 2011, um, finished that. There's a fairly big group there into behavioural finance, and so I sort of got interested in it. And uh, I took myself off to a conference in in Chicago. There's a Academy of Behavioural Finance conference, and 
I kind of I was never I didn't, didn't know a soul there, but uh, but, but like everyone crowded around me, and I didn't know what the hell I don't know <laughs> what's going on here, but uh, it was my accent, and, and uh, not the Aussie accent, but they wanted to know at that stage what it was like to live in a country where people still thought property prices couldn't fall. Um, so post post GFC, when around the world house prices have fallen fifty percent, ours had to dip from a week and then rebounded up. Um, and it got me thinking a lot about about that, and so I wanted to look at that in more detail. And hence, I kind of applied and got accepted to start a thesis um, for a doctorate. So, yeah, a fascinating topic. Um, tell us a little bit about that process. How did you go through your thesis? At, thesis as in, how did you set? What, what did you decide on would, would be the you were going to study? Yeah, uh, and tell us about the, the outcome. Yeah. So, what, what that was really about was was a belief I had, or a belief, which is a real important word in the thesis, but uh, a sense that. Um, People were, were at, the, at the time it got worse, but people were paying, spending so much of their resource, financial resource on property, on residential real estate, mm. spending so much money on it. But they were saying things to me like, I can't afford insurance. What do you mean? I've got a big mortgage. I can't afford extra super, super payments because mm. I've got a big mortgage. And sort of, why? Why are they having, why are they putting all of their resources into this one asset that they live in? You know, that, that's, uh, and, then, and then bidding prices up. So going to auctions and actively bidding against other people doing the same thing. So no sense of, this house is worth eight hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. If someone wants to pay one point two, good on them. It became I'm going to pay one point three, mm-hmm. or else I have to pay one point four next week. So this this sort of idea of prices only ever go up. I've got to get in now. Um, so what was causing that? And they uh, certainly wouldn't do that with an insurance policy or premium, would they? No. It's worth eight hundred dollars. I'll pay no. twelve hundred for it. Up. It's better yeah. up. Can I have it? Yeah, they're doing it with a car now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. they are. But uh, but but they normally wouldn't do it. You yeah. normally would. You go and bargain crazy, for things, right? It? You go and say, you know, like, I'm going to buy this. I'm, I'll give you a letter. You know, they bargain with it. But with a house, it was like I'll pay whatever I've got to pay. Yeah. Mm. And so I wanted to know what what was that about. And um, so over a period of, of, of a couple of years, I did a doctorate in uh, a professional doctorate, so doctorate of business administration. It's a, still a thesis and still, a, but it's a, a professional doctorate, which is a lot more um, practically orientated. A PhD is a, is a really a real theoretical approach. A real, uh, so as whereas a professional doctorate is a more uh, applied approach to, to research. So I wanted to look at uh, so what I sort of started to stumble across aside from going through the whole behavioural finance elements of yep. stuff and becoming really. I think I think pretty expert in behavioural finance from reading about 500 papers. Um, that the idea of beliefs, what, what are the beliefs behind this, and um, and and the influence became significant around the beliefs around past performance. So so um, so I, I set up a survey, and, and the study was involving a survey of really framing um, people's investment preferences by both both past performance and then by future expected return, and seeing there was differences, and there were very big differences between the two. So. So if you ask someone straight up, you know, what, what you prefer, how I did it was studying three options. I studied, yeah. the first option was residential real estate, second was Australian shares, and the third was superannuation. Now, superannuation, I know, is not an asset class, it's a tax structure, but in the general public's mind, superannuation is a thing. Mm. So it, it is it is the same as residential real estate and Australian shares in the public's mind. They don't see that as a tax structure, they see it as an investment thing. So, um, so the survey asked questions around that: what's your preferred investment of the three, um, and then and what do you think had done best over the previous three and the previous ten years, and seeing a relationship between between those dis- those sort of uh, factors, mm. and there was a pretty strong fact relation between those those things. Um, but people had had uh, most people thought residential real estate had did done best. In fact, we we, we polled the, the, the audience yesterday. Mm. And they said the same thing. They thought residential real estate had done the best. In fact, residential real what estate... What sort of swing of, I mean, the audience here, but what sort of, in your research, what uh, was around, that? Around 45% thought real estate had done best. Okay. Okay. And and, and uh, Australian shares worse than superannuation second. And in fact, the actual results were, were reversed. So I did re- research what was the best performing asset class over the 10-year period that I did the study and to now, and residential real estate was the worst performing uh, because people ignore the fact that it's geared at 80%. So what they see is I've put my, you know, I bought a house worth eight hundred thousand dollars, become one point two, it's grown by four hundred thousand dollars, and, and my money's gone. But that's only a, a three or four percent return over a five or six year period, you know. Whereas the share market had done seven or eight or nine percent return over that period, and super had done six or seven percent over that return. So there was a pretty clear relationship between um, belief around past performance, even though it was wrong. Mm. So sixty percent of people got it wrong. But the influence for residential real estate was if you believed that it had done best, you were six times more likely to want to invest in real estate than anything else. So a really heavy influence. So then I, in the survey, I then asked them to um, predict what the returns would be in the next 10 years. 
So with a, I gave, gave them a list of a list of outcomes. So let's say, for example, I would ask a question like, say you inherited one hundred eighty thousand dollars, but the proviso was you had to invest in a superannuation fund of your choice. Okay, what do you think it would grow to in ten years' time? And I gave them seven options of, of little ranges. You know, like one not seventy to two ten, or and each of those ranges, the midpoint equated to zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, or twelve percent compound returns. Okay, and then got them to predict, and then asked them, okay, after having done that, um, now what's your preferred investment? And materially changed. So the people who preferred investment halved. Okay, uh, the people who, who preferred superannuation or, or shares increased by about twenty five percent each. So it became apparent to me that that framing. Um, framing uh, mm. investment choice based on past performance versus expected future return was very significantly different. Did uh, when I think about this from the you know uneducated point of view, but I'm thinking about it from from points of view of conversations that I've had in the past. Um, it's, it's those beliefs that tends to tend to be there for a very long time. They're cultural beliefs or beliefs of parents growing up and from an early age. And and how how is it that people can change those beliefs by just a, a bit of logical evidence versus that emotional connection that they've got to it? I'm sure they don't change the belief. If I really ask them, they'd probably still say uh, property doubles every seven years, right? That's, that's the heuristic people people go by. Therefore, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't lose on property. The people will say this all the time. But, but the, the reality is that when you're faced with a number on a page, and especially if you've pushed the buttons on the calculator, which like I sort of said yesterday, if you get the clock, Get the clients to push the buttons on the calculator. Don't you do it. You, you get them to push the buttons and they see the outcome and they see what return that really means. Um, then they suddenly realise that doesn't sound right to me. Mm. So it's, it, there's a really material difference between the two. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. I'd be really... And your research probably didn't um, flex into this, but perhaps you have an opinion, Paul, is there's beliefs are one thing, but is, is property preferred, do you think, because I... I have, I can. Sh- there's that element of identity with property. I own all of these properties, and and they're you know things that I can talk around. Whereas, perhaps that ha- there isn't that um, there there's isn't status, that ownership. Status, yeah, status. Yeah, yeah, that's the word I'm looking for yeah. early in the morning. Yeah. Is, is there's a status element of having yeah. a number of properties? Whereas if you just have a share portfolio, like it doesn't seem as um, yeah. Yeah, so enhancing. what you're really saying is boasting about it. Correct. Right? Well, so yeah, I'm important because I've got four properties yeah. versus a big yeah. share portfolio. So there's something else we, we looked at um, is um, kind of the, the impact. Um, how am I going to say this? So one of the things we talked about yesterday was prospect theory. So the, one, of the, one of the key behavioral finance theories, one of the, in fact, the, the, the one, it's not the key, but it's the most popular, the most commonly known, you know, Tversky and Kahneman's prospect theory. But... One of the side effects, prospect theory basically says people feel losses significantly more than they enjoy gains in, in an emotional scale, right? Uh, it's often talked about twice as much, but there's no, there's no evidence it's a scale of twice to one, but there's more. But there's a, a kind of less commonly known side bit of prospect theory which kind of gets ignored, and that is when people are facing almost certain losses, they become risk-seeking, right? So, so when people are facing almost certain losses, they, start look, they don't know they are, but they become risk seekers. Hence this, the reason the casino makes money from yeah, gamblers. Yeah. Yep. So this is, this is exactly like I've lost 100 bucks at the pokies. I better keep playing to win, to win that money back, right? So I'm, I'm looking for more and more risk all the time. Now, I think um, I became interested in relative loss, okay, not just actual loss. And relative loss is exactly what you're talking about. If I've got friends who've got three investment properties and I haven't, got it. I feel like I've lost compared to them, right? And I better do that. Yeah, so the boasting about I've got three investment properties, aren't I great, has an impact on all the friends who haven't got three investment properties. Mm-hmm. It makes them want to feel like I'm going to take more risk now. I'm going to do something else to take yeah. more risk. And, and so, so you know, I talk about you know young non-homeowners are highly at risk of of of, uh, of prospect theory in that sense because I've got to pay whatever it takes to get into the market. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter. I've got mum and dad give me some more money. I need, you know, I'll lie to the bank. If I want to borrow more money. I'm going to give myself as much as I possibly can because I, I'm because I'm risk seeking mm. without any, any sense. When we see people now who who, who in, in their fifties have debt that they will never repay in their lifetime, um, more and more people are absolutely relying on inheritances to get out of debt. Uh, so you know, so I feel like people in property um, more likely to ignore the downside, mm. as in they would go, "Oh, the market's going up, my house is now worth that." But when there's a downside, they just ignore yeah. it because they'll know 
they feel like it will come back. Um, whereas I guess with market prices being yeah. so prominent, this is the exact value of your super fund as yeah. of today. Yeah. Um, it's a bit more in their face. Yeah. Look, you can't tell on the podcast, but I'm old. Um, and I was around in 1989 when house prices fell around 25%. Um, we had a big recession that we had to have at the time, and but literally house prices fell around 25%. Now, the only people who noticed that were people who had to sell. If I didn't sell, what, what, house prices didn't fall. Yeah, they did. <laughs> mm. They fell about 25%, but no one experienced that unless they had to sell. Nobody and, felt the pain. The ones who had to sell because they'd lost their jobs and, and couldn't pay the mortgages, when you trade hit 18%, they really felt the pain. Mm. They lost everything at that stage. And, and, and there's people around who still experience that. But but if I didn't have to it sell, then I didn't really notice it. Yep. And so, you know, and at the moment we've had this period of, of really, really ultra low interest rates, emergency low, you know, never be foreseen low interest rates, but it becomes normalised really quickly. And so we're, we're going interest rates where at the moment, which still aren't normal, you know. So yep. a 5% mortgage rate is still very low. But people are panicking about a five percent interest rate. Yes. Right? So you know, yes. It's, it's, well, I think there's a little bit of media in that too, with regards yeah. to the, they're just focusing on the increase. Yeah. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for coming on today's com- with com- today's conversation. If someone wanted to continue that conversation with you and and, and have a look at that research that yeah. you've done, what's probably the best way that they could reach out to you? Uh, they can probably email me if they want to. Um, we'll, certainly, if they're at the Congress listening to the podcast, uh, we're at the stand at the iFactFind stand. But uh, otherwise, they can look looking at Paul, Paul, Paul at iFactFind.com.au is the easiest place to, to catch me. So Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks Great. for chatting, Paul. My pleasure. Great. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this uh, podcast series we're doing from the Financial Planning Association Congress. Uh, I'm joined by Danny. Thank you for joining me, Danny. Thanks, Fraser. I'm still here. It's a mini series, but there's lots of... Seri- There's lots of episodes within the mini series. Absolutely, we covered seventeen not, conversations yesterday. It's is that not right, so many, Fraser? Not so many. <laughs> Do you want to introduce our next our next guest on yeah, the podcast? We have Ben Martian, so head of policy. Is that the correct term, head of policy at the FPA? I've actually had a title change. So oh, I'm have you? Should, the, I, should I start that again then? No, no, because <laughs> that's how I've always known you, Ben. Well, yeah, no, it's I, I'm I'm technically the general manager of policy and advocacy, but. I like my old title, which was Head of Policy, Strategy and Innovation, because I like the strategy. Uh, ben, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thank you. New, new title, new role, uh, same same position, same job. Same job. Amazingly, this everything, you know, yep. ben, ben will do it. Um, you will also get uh, dubbed within the Financial Planning Association as the, the guy who loves technology. So if, anything that there's technology involved, oh, ben, ben will take, take care of it. It's more I... Well, when you're reading 300 pages of legislation and writing 150-page submissions to government and, and regulators, you need something to keep you sane, and uh, technology is that for me. Fantastic. And uh, So one of the sessions we want to talk about in this... It's uh, close to your heart so, as well, Selfishly, Fraser. I want to talk about it, uh, is one of the sessions that came on the day before the Congress started. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about that session. So we have been running training sessions for members on doing video SOAs. And the idea there is that if you have a look at ASIC's Regulatory Guide 90, what they say is that they're technology neutral. And Fraser and I worked two and a half years ago on a paper called The Future of the SOA. And we tried to encourage everybody to use digital tools to better engage their clients. And I think with covid Royal Commission implementations, everyone's gotten really busy. So what we wanted to do was go really extreme. What's the most what's the cheapest and most efficient and most engaging way to provide an SOA to the client that's legal? And video is it. And I was uh, I was reflecting yesterday in the gin session that we had. Um, that would have been interesting reflections. It was, and I probably reflected a bit more on the quality of the gin later in yeah, the, the night. The Christmas one was my favourite. Yeah, it was good. Was favorite. But I'm yes. feeling it a little yeah, today. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is early this morning. And he was talking about the sandwich theory, which is, and he was talking about the fact that people don't like to cross the road to buy a sandwich. And what we do in financial planning is we spend 10 to 15 hours making a sandwich that nobody wants to eat. Um, so the video SOA is the sandwich theory that the the most efficient way to document the advice that you're providing to a client is to record it when you tell the client. So as long as you meet the eight requirements of a statement of advice. I, I, I love the word document uh, as a documentary. Yes. It's documented on film, uh, not on, not necessarily on paper. I think that's uh, certainly something that is a, something that people can get their head around. 
Um, I also refer to the document of advice being the document of advice and a statement being the words that come out of your mouth. Yeah. Um, now, the statement of advice is one of those things that's a, a regulatory disclosure requirement. There's lots of moving pieces to that puzzle. For example, you need to make sure you've got a basis of advice and you know your client. You've got to make sure that you've scoped the advice appropriately. Uh, you've got to make sure you cover off on strategy and product and how you selected product and you've got to make sure you talk about fees and all the other things. So. How do, they, how do uh, planners do that then in, in the process of a video? I mean, one of the, I think, the key takeaways that you've spoken about a lot is the fact that it's not a pre-prepared video. No, it's not a pre-prepared video. So when you're in that meeting with a client where, they're, where you're providing the recommendations to them and you're talking through the strategies and you're talking through the products, as long as you hit the eight points that you need to in an SOA, then you have met your disclosure obligations in terms of the SOA. The only really tricky one is how you put a cover page on an SOA with the title statement of advice with your AFSL number and, and who's providing the advice. Um, but if you get past that one, you will go through the client's financial position, you'll go through their goals and objectives, you'll go through the strategies, you'll go through the products, you'll talk about the benefits and disadvantages of those. If you're replacing one product with another, you'll have that conversation with the client, you'll have a conversation about fees. And if you're doing all that, then you meet all your regulatory obligations in terms of the SOA. And so the only thing that you probably want to think about and your licensee might want you to think about is how, make, how you make sure you cover off all of those things. And so what we've done is created an agenda that is just a plain slide deck which you can make look really good. You, can, you could print it out and put it on the table and make sure you go through the points. You could create it into a presentation. You could build it into your software flow. Um, but it makes sure that you go through all the points you need to to cover off all your regulatory obligations. Yeah. It was interesting. We were speaking to Corey yesterday, who's now started to embed the video yes. SOA. So he has saved, was it six hours in that process? Yeah, dramatically changed their advice process. And it was And really, the scalability of advice as well. And he was sort of talking around how it was really nice where finally there's a space where the client experience and great advice can actually lead the process rather than a compliance framework. So that's, yeah, I mean, how is the adoption? Beyond, like, are there people taking up the ideas? What's, what's the op- adoption of this SOA in yeah, video so, form? So we've had more well, around 140 planners come through the training sessions that Fraser and I have run um, awesome. over the last 12 months or so. That's a lot of hours potentially saved. That is a lot saved. of hours. And um, we've, got a, we've got a great community of, of planners who are helping each other and having conversations about how to get their compliance teams across this, how to get their PI insurers across it, what technology they're using. Um, and we're seeing a lot more members out of that 140 start to actually produce video SOAs for their clients. And the feedback we're getting is that depending on how long it takes to edit up the document, they're saving 10 to 15 hours per client wow. in the advice process, which is probably seeing another two to three clients a week, awesome, even a day um, in, in doing that and saving all that back office time and, and effort. And the clients love it. Because as much as you say, as much as people kind of go, our clients really going to be comfortable watching a video back? People actually love watching videos of themselves. That's why we have mobile phones and that's why we take videos of our experiences. Selfies. Selfies. They're yeah. all the thing in Bondi where I live. <laughs> but, it's, but it's also the fact that um, when we talk about watching a video of themselves, it's re-watching the video, right? Because they it's were, re-watching. They were right. already in the conversation in the first place. They experienced 100% of the advice. They're, they're, it's not like they didn't read the document of advice that, you know, they can't get away with saying, I didn't know it or you didn't tell me at the time mm-hmm. because they were there. They, were, they experienced it. And different learning styles as well. Like if you're, if you're if, if hearing how someone speaks or reading something is not your learning style and it's not my learning style, I'm a very visual learner, it's very difficult to take a lot of information in when it's presented in a way that doesn't absorb. So having this video SOA and, and thinking how you include it into your software flow, as you said, Ben, is you can get really creative with adapting it to that person's learning style because you really want them to understand the advice given. Absolutely. And Michelle Levy was talking about it yesterday on stage. She was talking about the fact that the current legislative framework creates this process flow and you know it says who can provide advice and who can't and, and what documents you have to provide the client and what your conduct obligations are. And she says it doesn't make sense. What the client wants is advice. 
And the the real way the client gets the advice is when you speak to them and you have the conversation with them and you make the recommendations to them and they say, yes, that makes sense to me or no, that doesn't make sense to me, let's change this around. That's when advice is provided. Yeah, I, th- I, I really think that from a consumer point of view, there's two things they want. They want advice, but they want a plan. They yeah. want a financial plan. And most people come in thinking that they're going to get a financial plan. And when they see a document, they think, oh, that must be my plan. Um, and people have said to me, and we've had a lot of, you know, yeah, but what about that conversations over the years? And people have great objections, which are all worth exploring. Um, and, and, and even right now, uh, planners say to me, look, you know, I think my clients would still want some sort of paper, and I'm thinking, well, do, do a do a plan. Give them a plan. What they pay for. That's a really good point. Yeah, and uh, and so and so if we if we get back if we've done the disclosure requirements in the conversation, then the the a document, uh, we're talking about a paper or a visual piece of paper that you know, might be online, but it might be able to be printed, um, could still be something that's a lot more visual and, and be more around you know, their plan rather than uh, the, the disclosure requirements. Absolutely. And part of the problem with 80-page, 100-page SOAs is an A4 piece of paper restricts you in how you communicate with clients. Whereas if you provide them with a, a plan, uh, there's lots of technology solutions that give you an infinite canvas. You can make that plan as yeah. big or as little as what you need and the client can zoom in and zoom out and and engage with it in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I think one of the big blocks with, with, with a lot of the technology providers out there has been trying to convert that that content that they're creating or, or the or the graphs they're creating or the data that, that you know they're producing into a document. And if you if you're avoiding that piece, you can still demonstrate on a on a visual screen and in a beautiful way what that uh, what that you know projection might look like, or that strategy outcome might look like, uh, or that product selection might look like in on a screen, rather than having to then convert it to to an A4 piece of paper. That's right, and I think you know even technology is guilty of this. They're guilty of of creating a process and creating tools and creating solutions that they think consumers want but what they're actually producing is what licensees want um mm. iris yesterday was on stage talking about the fact they got two and a half thousand screens that a financial planner can go through when they're talking to their clients about advice that's not what clients want clients just want to know how they can meet their goals and objectives they just want to know how the strategies are going to make their life better and you know some of them are going to understand salary sacrifice and some of them you're going to have to talk through the process. Mm. One, of the, one of the things I really enjoyed through this process, Ben, is the fact that there's been no legislative change required to do this. No. Uh, we're not waiting on the legislation changes. There's been no different technology systems have to be prepared. Everyone's currently using Zoom or Teams, and they know how to record a, a meeting. Absolutely. Yes. And, no, and, that, and that, that's exactly what we're pointing to. You can in the conversation you have with the client you meet all your SOA obligations you to your point Fraser we're already using Zoom you just need to make sure you've got a camera that picks up you and picks up the client you need to have a microphone that picks up the conversation and you need to record the screen to show them the information you need to show them and you're you're done yep and ASIC uh, I mean we've got ASIC coming at uh, a session shortly um, I went to ask Leah Shaka from ASIC, the, the lead of advice at ASIC, is video SOA all right? And I know she's going to say yes, because we've had that conversation that many times. The regulator says they're technology agnostic. As long as you meet your obligations, then it doesn't matter how you document your advice. You started this process many years ago, like talking around the, the video SOA. Has the regulator always been as supportive or has that been the journey that you've taken? Like from the beginning, did they say, yes, we, we're agnostic on how this is delivered? Like what's that journey been like? Yeah, no, we, so in 2017, uh, ASIC redid RG90 and they had some consultations and, and Fraser, you were in a different different job, but I was here at the FPA at the time and we started having conversations and we ASIC kept making the point we're technology neutral. We don't we don't really care what the document mm. format is as long as you meet the obligations. And, and we asked them to clearly spell out in RG90, uh, are infographics all right? And they said, yes, infographics are all right. Are videos all right? Yes, videos are all right. Are audio clips all right? Yes, audio clips are all right. Can we do it digitally? Can it be in an HTML file rather than a, a paper-based format? Yes, that's fine. And we kept going through a list of different technologies and they kept saying, 
yes, that's fine. So since twenty seventeen, as our previous answer, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So ASIC, um, ASIC in their regulatory guides, uh, RG ninety talks about the SOA, RG two four four talks about uh, the the delivery of disclosure obligations, and it talks about being technology neutral. So they've they've said it's fine. And then the other yeah, but that comes up is is yeah, but what's Africa going to think about it? And uh, and you know we can we can grab the guys from Africa who are here as well, but um. But they love watching videos, the conversation you have with the client. And what they can do is really quickly point out to the client, actually, that thing you're complaining about, you and the planner talked about it at minute 53. Yeah, it makes it quite clear. And you explain back to the planner what that strategy was and why that product was right for you and why you agreed with it and why you understood it it met your goals and objectives. What are you complaining about? Yeah, any, any dispute resolution is very fast for both Africa or PI for that matter. They either know straight away whether it is a claim or it's not and it gets settled. So the, there's not that ongoing large legal obligations around you know, trying to gather all the, the evidence is all, all there. And, and when um, the regulators do those file reviews, they do a full file review. It's not just the video, that, the, the, the statement of advice or whatever it might be. It's everything that you've got. So all your file notes and all those sort of things as well. So it's, it's very much around, um, you know, a, com- a complete file note. Um, and just, just on ASIC, I've, from all the dealings I've had with ASIC over the years, they're, they're they're not so much the, the police like they're made out to be. They're actually just the protector of consumers, right? And so most planners that I know are also the protector of consumers. And so they're kind of on the same page to me as a lot of planners. And I know that there's this fear of ASIC when really the fear shouldn't be of ASIC. If, if you're doing the right thing by your consumers and you're protecting them, that you, you're on the same page. No, and I think if you have a look at the action ASIC has taken against financial planners over the years... They're pretty egregious examples of terrible things that financial planners have done to, to clients. And ASIC should be taking action against those people who are ruining clients' lives and, and creating a bad reputation for planners. But they're not the bad guys in any of this. And, and I have a very, very strong and good working relationship with ASIC. And I can ring them up and ask them questions and clarify things. And they're real nice yep. Yep. lovely people and one of the things I just call them to quickly cover too is that we, we get this question a lot is it's great if you're doing a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting you can record that uh, online and you've got the client at their house and you, you at, at you know you in your office but what about for people coming into offices can people coming back into offices how do you do a video SOA for in, in person yes I mean it can be as simple as just pointing the camera at the room and making sure you've you've got both you and the client in there and hit record on the Zoom meeting that you otherwise would have been doing. Yep. Um, there's a lot of screen capture technology if you want to get a little bit more sophisticated. But if you're used to using Teams, if you're used to using Zoom, just start up a Zoom meeting and only have one participant in it, which is the room, and share the screen into it and... You're yep. capturing everything. And probably the final objective I want to get to before we uh, uh, finish this podcast is the concept of recording and that mindset shift that if people aren't currently recording their, their meetings, they, they have a fear around oh, the clients wouldn't want to and yet when every time we talk to people who record their meetings, they clients never say no, hardly ever say no. Uh, I think we had, we had one person who'd been recording their meetings for five years uh, two days ago and he said he's had one client in that five-year period said they weren't comfortable with the meeting being recorded it's yeah. not the right client for him yeah he records his meetings that's his process that client is not his client mm. yep fantastic i have a very simple question and i might be missing something here but this seems like a, a, such a logical solution it seems like it, it's almost for lack of a better example at the uber of fun, like the uber that was always something that we should have had but took so long to get here or the airbnb what, what has been the delay in bringing... If, if ASIC's never had a sort of a problem with how technology is delivered, and this has been something that's been taking a bit of time to come through, I know you've been talking about this for a long time, Fraser. What, what it, is it just how thorough the process has been or has there been... Because it's taken a couple of years to bring this to life for people to start adopting it. What's been the, the t- sort of time delay? So there's, there's two issues in my head, and maybe you've thought of some more, but... Mm. Um, Issue number one is when the Corporations Act came about and statements of advice were, were put into the law, honestly, the best piece of technology you could 
you could use to consistently provide advice to your clients at that time was was word processing, and so it was a natural natural way to deliver uh, documenting your advice to the client was to use word documents. That made sense at the time. You could it was a step use, up from using the typewriter at the time. It was, and and you could use templates, and it, it was the most efficient way to do it. The reality is, we've had, it, and it's not today. The, the, the quickest and easiest way to create a document today is to pull out your phone to your point, turn the camera around so it's recording you and press record. And that's the quickest way to document something today. But the reality is we've had nearly 20 years of constant regulatory change. And so any time a financial planning business has had the opportunity to sit down and, and actually make a change to their business, it's probably to be, been to implement some piece of regulatory change. You think since 2007, 2008, we've gone through the GFC, so that was chaotic for us. We then had FOFA. We then had the Professional Standards and Education Framework. We had the Life Insurance Framework. We had the Royal Commission. We've had the Royal Commission implementation. I can go on. I mean, they're just the 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 big ones, right? So so anytime we've had time or or money, we've had to make regulatory change. Mm. So we haven't had time to sit down and, and think about is paper still the right way to record? I, I also think. I also think if we go back to that when FSR came in in two thousand and one, the lawyers read through the legislation. They went, um, "This is a, a obviously it's a document. Of course it is. What could about else could it be? Because everything that legal uh, has done uh, ever past, whether it's writing wills or creating contracts, has been on paper. Yeah. And so they they were charged with the task of creating a document that would suffice to the the legislation. And so. Ever since then, we've been uh, at the mercy of the legal fraternity that says this is how we do things. Now, the the fact that it's a statement of advice is not a document. Uh, sorry, it's not a contract. It doesn't have to be a document. It can be a statement. You can state it, uh, just as we're stating our opinions on the podcast today uh, without anything in writing. So I think um, uh, I think we get stuck in this place. And the compliance teams for AFSLs, they just do what the lawyers say. You know, they just go, well, we've got to make sure that that our business model, which is our license, doesn't get taken away, and then we do that through a legal form. So I think what's happened is it's been legally led uh, and not so much consumer led. And the whole purpose of a statement of advice is to provide the client with the relevant information that that particular client needs to make an informed decision, right? Whether to proceed with the advice or not proceed with the advice. And that is the purpose of a statement of advice. It's not about producing long documents, which we're about used to. Clients come in, they want advice, they want plans, uh, and we go and give them an SOA because that's the way the lawyers assumed. We need a contract, but it's not a contract. Oh, that's my high horse. <laughs> I'm getting on my soapbox. Gosh. It's a good soapbox. I learned a lot from that. Thanks, Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, blah, information. Yeah, I think we probably should wrap this one up. Um, that, that, we'll wrap Fraser that, up. That's what yeah. I'm just that's that why it takes a, that somebody, takes why, why it takes a full day session to uh, train everybody up on Somebody up turn on Fraser's this. mic down before he gets himself in trouble. But the, the training sessions we're doing, we're answering all these questions, we're answering these yeah buts, we're talking to compliance people, we're talking to lawyers, we're talking to, to PI. Um, but the training session is really about making you comfortable with the, the process, what you need to actually cover off. And then we do a heap of, of live action players. We get, the, we get the bad video SOAs out of the way in a safe environment. Uh, with us and and what our members are doing is going away having done two or three video SOAs in the training session and they're ready to go back to their office and start doing it with their clients. Yep, that's And the it's point. so fantastic that so much rigour is being put into this rather than just being adopted because if everyone's really thinking about it and thinking about whether it's something they want to do and it's taking a lot of time to, to think through that and work through that, I, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Means no. that they really care about the quality of whatever they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll just repeat what we said at the moment. It it's a recording of the meeting with the client. It's not standing in front of a green screen and and just speaking out into the world. Um, that that is adding additional time to your advice process. The same way that, that creating a paper based SOA is. We're talking about recording the meeting. You're having the meeting anyway. Writing the advice anyway. Just record it then and there. Yep. Meet your regulatory obligations and you're done. Follow follow a fairly strict agenda that makes sure he covers your points and actually make your points. Yep. Save file, share the client, SOA, out the door. And that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our 
very long micro series of fireside chats. We're into day two. So we're at the FPA Congress. It's the 30th birthday of um, the FPA's Congress. So it's fantastic to be here. Now, Fraser has darted off and I'm joined by a new co-host. Hey, Clayton. Hey, how's it going? And we have a very special guest to kick off the discussions. Hi, William. How are you going? Good, thank you. So, can you, before we dive into your session and what you're talking about at the FPA Day, can you tell everyone who's listening a little bit about what you do? Because it's a bit unique. Sure. So, um, I'm William Jones. I am uh, uh, the founder of two companies, Health and Finance Integrated, which gives advice to people after suffering a complex health condition, and ClaimRight, which is a claims platform, administration service, That makes claims easier for things like NDIS, Centrelink, and insurances. So we do everything. Fantastic. And you've also had a heritage of being a financial planner. Correct. Well, I am a financial planner, but I'm also a disability. So a practicing financial planner. Yeah, excellent. a practicing financial planner. Um, Wearing many hats. Wearing many hats. But these days, I'm more of a tech head. So people come to me for tech advice, if you like. Fantastic. And I'm not talking about like computer advice. I'm talking about like technical. Yeah, you've got to make that advice. clarification <laughs> these days. No, thank you so That's much. Right. That's um, but also um, on the I, I hold a master's in disability studies from Flinders School of Medicine. So that makes it a little bit better for me when it comes to understanding impairments and disabilities. I'm wow. so glad you explained all of that because I would have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have got lost in all of your achievements. So thank you. Yeah. So how did you get up? How did you end up in the claims disability space? What drew you to that particular area? Back in when I started Health and Finance Integrated, uh, we had a great relationship with MS Australia. They put me up as, uh, as a guy that people with MS should go to. And what happened was I was getting a lot of people um, seeking my advice mm. after having seen a legal uh, uh, represent a lawyer, a, a, a yeah. lawyer, legal specialist, mm. etc. And by then it was too late to do any meaningful work because the way that works is that the lawyer would do the claim and they do a fantastic job, right? They do a fantastic job, but then the way to get paid is to take the money out of the superannuation system and put it in the lawyer's trust account. The lawyer will take their fee and they give the residual to the client. And by then the tax has already been withheld, you know, withheld from by the fund. Um, and Centrelink and everything else has already factored in that this person has got all this money out of super. So for a lawyer to get paid, it screws the client. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, but that's the deal. That the you know the lawyer's job is not to kind of preserve sure, yeah. the future. The, do the, do the, the financial law- planning. Right. It's right, there. right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. They're there to execute a transaction. Yeah. Efficiently. Mm-hmm. And yeah. That's what and want to and want to get paid. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 And so I kind of thought, okay, well, what we really need to do is speak to the lawyers about um, you know the process, and I did, and and. They kind of listen, but the reality is financial planning takes a good month, two months. And so for a lawyer to kind of say, look, I'm, gonna, I'm happy to hold on, you know, mm. my payment is going to be pending. Mm. Um, and then there is no guarantee because superannuation is a protected thing from bankruptcy. A lot of these people didn't have any other money. So there was like a trust issue by, you know, lawyer-client issues and all that sort of stuff. And mm. I thought to myself, well, I think we can do this better. Um, and I think we can do it cheaper. How much are you charging? You're charging X percent. I think I can do it for one fifth of that. And that excellent. And that kind of got me thinking about how do I measure body impairments really efficiently? Because part of the issue that we were having uh, is that um, medicos didn't understand the disability definitions. They didn't understand uh, somebody's diagnosed with MS, but what does MS mean? Like, is it cognitive impairment? What's the rate of cognitive impairment? If somebody has got Heat exhaustion, okay, what does that mean in the workplace? Uh, if somebody's got bladder control issues, how often, how frequent? So you needed an occupational physician to interpret the, what MS really means or a neurologist to go into it. That meant that there was a lot of money being exchanged at the medical side of things for people to write these reports, a lot of time wasted. And I figured, wait, I know how to do this. I'll create the... The, the app, the, the ecosystem that measures impairments, and we will then generate a report to go to their normal GP 
who mm-hmm. will look at this and say, gee, this is pretty good, and I'll sign off on it. And that's what happened. So that's that mm-hmm. claim, right? Um, you know, that's how we've been able to add efficiencies and reduce costs. So you're talking about all the whole person impairment measures. That right, right, right. Within, within, that within that 25 minutes. Yep. Exactly. Within 25 minutes, we know exactly where the impairment is, how severe it is, and we generate a report that is comprehensive. Because you take that to two or three different doctors. I know from my time in insurance, if you take that to two or three different doctors, you'll have two or three or four or five different measures of whole person impairment on depending on how they've done that sort of measurement. So that's fantastic. Exactly. And Centralize that and giving them a little bit of support and calculating Exactly. That. But the thing is, when we designed it, we didn't just design it for the purpose of insurance claims. Mm. We designed it for Centrelink and we designed it for NDIS. Mm. And so what that meant was I achieved what I wanted to say, what I set out to achieve with, when I started the financial planning side, which is I wanted to people, I wanted people to have suitable accommodation, stable income, and good care. And so by us being able to, uh, you know, do the claim, often what that meant is that the money was then being used for the purposes of housing, um, et cetera, but appropriate housing, mm. um, you know, paying mortgages, et cetera. Um, the second thing I wanted to do was ensure that the disability support pension or any other benefits um, were, uh, were uh, being paid quickly. And the rate of uh, 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 rejection is 74%. On those, so I wanted to reduce that, and we reduced it. Now we've got a five percent rejection rate. Whoa! Which is like ninety-five. So, mm. like this is Australia-wide, it's seventy-six percent rejection, right? Or seventy-four, seventy-six. I wanted to reduce that because there's no. I can't understand how we could have a margin of error mm. <laughs> of like seventy-five percent. Seventy-five percent. We've done this, but we're wrong seventy-five percent of the time. Yeah, like so. if you're if you're if you're a government body, how could you be proud of a margin of error of 75%? So, to me, there was something wrong with the system. And I've discovered that it's the actual impairment ratings and the, the, legisl- and the measurement of impairments and what it means to have a permanent impairment versus a doctor who says, this person can't work anymore. It's complicated, right? It's so complicated. So this comes to your session that you're talking about right, right, right. today, later today. Exactly. And so you're going to be breaking all of that down. Well, as much as possible. I mean, we've got 45 minutes to kind of break down a whole lot of stuff. But this gets people to start thinking about where the issues are in the mm. system. So maybe they can do their own digging and get them to start thinking about these things from um, a strategy point of view. Perfect. And that's what it's about. So what are the things in that 40, you've only got 45 minutes, what are the things that are really important for, what are the pitfalls that you definitely want to avoid um, in your strategy piece in this disability space? Uh, I think uh, you've got to understand that perhaps financial planners can play a exceptional role in, uh, in what disability is. Um, and, and, and how to remove that disability and create abilities. Mm. So it's a matter of, I mean, you're disabled if somebody keeps reminding you that you are uh, faced with challenges all the time. And so is, is there a space where, um, or room for a financial planner to remove some of those obstacles out of the way uh, of the systems that we're associated with? I'll give you an example of that. Mm. So, and, and we're not talking about disability now, but we'll talk about disabling factors. Let me give you an example. Somebody goes and applies for insurance. They've got, they go and see a psychologist because of COVID. The psychologist says, you, listen, you've got generalized anxiety disorder. And we then get an uh, exclusion for mental health. Okay? So there are two obstacles that can be removed by the financial planner at this point. First of all, a generalized anxiety disorder is a permanent condition. The question is, is this really generalized anxiety disorder or did the guy just have a little hard time during COVID and if that is the case then you would go back to the psychologist and kind of challenge them push back say hey this is a permanent condition this guy is fine now how could it be that he is fine if it's a permanent condition without medications without therapies or it could be what they call adjustment disorder which is basically burnout right Right. and you think oh because when you do something like slap somebody with a an generalized anxiety disorder, you need 20 visits, not one or two to slap somebody with a, with a disorder. Totally. Right? And so, guess what? That was last week. We had this case. The psychiatrist came back and he said, well, yeah, you're right. We'll remove that. We'll do it. So then they gave the client two years exclusion, mental health exclusion, to be reviewed. 
the next question, if I wanted to push back on that, I would say, okay, under Section 46 of the Disability Discrimination Act, the insurer has three ways to discriminate by slapping a exclusion. One of them is that you've got to show me actually uh, through actuarial uh, data or, or through medical data or any other data that this person as part of a general population is going to have an episode down the track sure, or yep. more likely that and they might come back with a legitimate um, data but it's on them under the DDA to prove to me otherwise it's discrimination so you're every underwriter's best friend. <laughs> well, I think I, yikes! I, I've I been think, an underwriter. That would right, scare me. Right, and so and so and so back back maybe six seven years ago, I took a big company to the uh, to the Human Rights Commission, and they said the the Human Rights Commission said you're absolutely right. This is discrimination. It's arbitrary discrimination. And uh, now, of course, if you wanted to do something about that, like in a practical terms, there is no. It's an arbitration system. Um, and if you're not happy with the arbitration, then you go to court, and a lot of people won't go to court. But the point is this, is that the financial planner needs to know these little things so they can do business better, and they can remove obstacles. And serve their client better, right, ultimately. Right, yes. right, right. And it, it kind of makes us cool. Yeah. Um, and it kind of makes us scary. And yeah. It makes, it makes us, uh, you know, the underdog. Yeah. And I like all that. <laughs> I've never, I've never heard underwriting claims cool underdog. But well, look, we're reinventing things, right? Right, right. This is this is a professional financial. I, so, so we, I interviewed uh, William a while ago, and uh, and you've got an amazing backstory, right? Yeah. Compared to like for even how you got here, which which I know is a one of the major sort of driving factors right. for for even for you to describe what it is that you do as what you do. Um, and so it all makes sense in, in, in context and I uh, would welcome anyone to go back through the, the archives of the XY podcast to listen to that podcast. It's one of the most standout podcasts, you know, I was ever a part of. Um, but what, what, what you, what you are describing right here and right now is truly what, um, what financial planning is because financial planning is, um, understanding the rules in your subset better than anyone else, including the person you speak to at the government, including the person you speak to at the product provider, including the lawyer that deals with this, the psychologist. And it's not always going to be around health, right? Yeah. It, 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 there, there are many different areas to go into. But the thing that I really, really appreciate what it is that you do is that you created your own skill set to become an expert in what you saw as an issue. And mm. and find, that is financial planning. The the level of area, the, the amount of areas that you can go into and deep dive into. Because you know you know what it took for you to become proficient at what it is that you do? Hard work. Yeah. Much more than your graduate yeah. diploma where you learn about how to do a, a risk assessment, right? right. It, 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 the, that pursuit of, uh, of, a, of, of a higher skill set, I just so appreciate in any financial planner. I, I agree with that. And, and you find that the best financial planners are financial planners who kind of start being inquisitive about the system. Absolutely. Because they identify that the job of a financial planner is to be the conduit between the person and the financial system. Yep. And the financial system is not just superannuation or insurance. It's an entire ecosystem. Oh, yeah. Um, that includes when somebody gets into hospital, they get you to, find, to sign financial consent. Stuff like that. Like, I got into hospital and they got me to, uh, said, oh, you know, this, this and that. And then they gave me a $3,000 bill. And I was thinking to myself, well, I never signed anything because I know from my time as a financial planner, I need to sign something to consent to spend money. So I dug up and I found that before any surgery, that the, fi the doctor is kind of like a financial planner in a lot of ways. And that they have to get a signature like we get on an SOA. Now, my doctor never got a signature from me. And so, therefore... They can't charge me. Wow. So I went back to him and I said, hey, I looked at this consent stuff and it sounds like you're a lot like me. I can't charge without having consent. Yeah. And you can't charge if you can't. He yeah. goes, ah, oh, we stuffed up. <laughs> do you want to oh, sign, sign it now? The business yeah, that I've grown so. for 20 <laughs> years, I've just realized it's been illegal. <laughs> now, yeah, now, listen, I, I ended up paying the guy sure, something. Sure. You know, I, you know, but the point is, people, but, but, but it's still the point. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, I'm in a privileged position in that I'm also the chair of the Certified Financial Planning designation. So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now is going back into the practice of financial planning and the Certified Financial Planning program. 
Um, do we have, you know, we want to move away from, uh, you know, what universities used to teach 20 years ago to something a bit more dynamic to make it more relevant. And people want relevance. Yes. So this is relevant. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Great. William, thank you for joining us in this morning's very early sessions. I've learned a lot. I Look, I am going to try and get to your session because it sounds amazing. Thank you. Good luck. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our podcast, uh, Mega, uh, what are we going to call Mega it? Mini, mini Series. Mega Mini Series, uh, brought to you uh, from the Financial Planning Association uh, Conference, Congress, I should say. Mm, uh, day two. Day two. We are, I'm losing my mind already. Uh, Danny and I are joined by the Honourable the honorable Bernie Ripple. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Fantastic to have you along. Now, of course, uh, we uh, most of the people know you from your original work that you did in superannuation, uh, the the Ripple report? Yep, yep. So, um, yeah, it seems quite some time ago now because it was, and uh, it, it was a major piece of reform, really born out of the uh, storm financial collapse and born out of you know, thousands of consumers really losing their life savings through you know, mismanagement of schemes and a whole range of other things. And, and, um, uh, and I think... At that time, it was probably the, the straw that broke the camel's back, to use that sort of analogy, uh, around the parliament needing to step in and do more for uh, for consumers and really led to some, some big thinking around where the future for financial advice and advisors would be. And, and today, obviously, we're here talking about, you know, what does advice look like in 2030? Yeah, we're talking about the future. Now, we, uh, we, we've been through the past. Now, tell us a little bit about what you're doing the, the, these days. You're no longer in, 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 the, in the government role. You're sure. sort of work, working more in financial services. You, yep. you love the space. You love the yep. technology space. Tell us about what you're doing now. Yeah, so I'm with Otivo, which is the, the rebranded Map My Plan. And so we're a self-directed digital advice platform. I'd say we're, we're breaking new ground and it's always a challenge when you're doing that. Um, you often hear about uh, a lot of talk about innovation and people say they're constrained and no one innovates and, and to some extent I'd agree. I'd, I'd say that this sector hasn't been innovating. some good reasons why. It's, it's expensive and when things work, you just keep doing what you're doing. Mm. But we had a, a really big vision and we've got a big vision about what the future of advice looks like and the, the key thing about that is that right now only about you know, arguably 10 or 15% of Australians actually get advice. And our thinking is, well, what about the other 85 or even 90% of Australians who need advice? I think the demand's there, but there's a real challenge in terms of how you deliver that on scale, affordably. You know, there's all the things that we already understand. And so our mission really is to be able to deliver that quality advice uh, you know, to any Australian that wants it for the price of a cup of coffee a week. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a big step change on how you get there and how you make that real. Uh, that, that's our goal. That's what we've been working on for quite a few years now. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly yeah. appears that the cost of providing yeah. advice has gone up a lot in the last few mm. years and, yeah. uh, and certainly a lot more than a cup of coffee. Yep. And also, it, it, as we talk about, I guess, the, the gap in advice, one of the widening gaps and the disparities, I guess, is around when you look at uh, women mm. and their, you know, the advice and, I guess, things like the pay gap. And So are there any things that you're doing to address like in that innovation space? specifically to address those things because I think as an industry I mean and I'm always part of these conversations where we are always looking at innovation but there's still I guess a widening gap in some of those imbalances in super balances in I guess in in generic pay those things are only increasing and COVID hasn't sort of helped Mm. Uh, is there anything that you're seeing in that 2030 vision to address those yep so, so there's um, there's a fair bit in that, Danny. Okay, so, great, um, good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and unpack a few bits of it uh, sort of sequentially. But uh, look, you're 100% right and everyone acknowledges it and there's work being done in terms of um, uh, gender inequity and pay gaps and superannuation. And it's a consequence of um, our economy and how we live mm. our lives. And they're really difficult things to fix. So I think for, for all of us in terms of... You know, I think there's a willingness uh, from a regulatory perspective and parliament and community. Everyone wants to sort of try to get mm. that balance as, as close as possible. A lot of work being done, still a lot of work to go. There's no question about that. You know, what can we do and what are we trying to do through you know, our platform? Probably the simplest way to respond to that would be to say we're gender neutral. What we're really do, doing is providing a system and technology and a platform which uh, democratises advice. It's really about saying it's open to everyone at a, at a price uh, which is affordable to everyone and can help everyone regardless of gender or family circumstances. 
And so it really opens that up because often the traditional model of advice, the face-to-face, it's expensive for a good reason. Rather than for me to look at these things in terms of is it cheap or expensive, I say, is it good value? You know, because it doesn't matter how much you pay. If it's great value, then that's what's important. It's the value proposition. Uh, And I've always said to the financial advice sector, you should charge according to value and what's appropriate, whatever that might be. I don't argue if people earn a lot of money. Uh, But there's also a really big piece that's needed uh, to help people on that life journey, that financial journey, on how do they access it, how do they do it. And I think if we look at 2030 as the benchmark, um, you know, I'm looking at what does an advisor look like? Well, I'd say just very simply, she will be a lot younger than what's around today in terms of an advisor, the average age, um, also much better educated. It'll be university education and it'll be someone who's come to the industry direct, not from another sector. So I think that's quite bright, and I think that the demand means that we're going to have a lot more service needed for people uh, providing advice directly face-to-face, expensive, time-consuming, complicated, uh, and a really big role to play for digital platforms and technology to support that and begin that journey for people. You know, And there's plenty of good examples, but I'll... Yeah, 100%, <laughs> and obviously the, the, the session that you were, were yep. involved in yep. uh, here at, at the Congress was all, was about that, you know, yep. 2030, the, the looking forward in, in what it might look like. Um, technology to me is a, uh, has done a good job at looking at efficiencies, it's done a good job at looking at, you know, process. Outside of financial services software, there's other types of technology that does some great stuff in, you know, uh, know, medical fields, there's some great technology that's used in looking at capacity with a human, there's some great stuff that looks at how does somebody have uh, an an intimacy, an intimate connection with Mm. the technology, Um, there's dating apps that have have worked this sort of stuff out, Uh, are we still going to start to see these other types of technologies then move into, into advice? Absolutely, and they're already here. Mm. I'd like to say that Otivo actually does a, a lot of that. So there's two key components you know, to make it simple. One is dealing with complexity. We live in a very complex world. It's not getting simpler. It's actually getting more complex. And that complexity and that interconnectivity is what can really make a difference to someone who's seeking an answer to a simple question is, what do I do next? So in terms of financial life, what do I do next? My pay's coming in. I've had a windfall. I've had a big cost. What do I do next? And so... That's where the technology can really help and it can help to give you advice and nudges and provide options and people still need to make decisions for themselves, but you need to empower people. That's the financial literacy piece, right? How, do you, how does someone get empowered? Well, they need to be financially literate uh, around what's happening in their lives. The other really important piece around the technology question is really that it becomes so integrated in your life that you're no longer asking the question and so, for you know, there's lots of examples of that. I mean, no one thinks twice about, you know, texting or Snapchatting or everything else. That's just part of normal life. Uh, when you want to transfer even large sums of money to someone, uh, you just get on your phone, you do it instantly right in front of them. We don't even question that as something. It's integrated into every part of our daily life. Financial advice is not, not yet, but it will be. Uh, and the power of that will mean that, that that's the empowerment. That's what it will help people do to make decisions and then whether they choose to just focus on the platform that has their critical data they won't even need to enter it manually you know we we do direct connections and drop downs from your bank accounts from your super fund from uh how much you're earning etc etc so the tech's already there the big data drives it and it'll help to inform individuals on making better and better decisions so when do you start to him because because all of those add-ons to our lives mm. and enhance our lives and we kind of just seamlessly work with, yep. they become part of our lives because they're kind of put into our world at a certain yep. time and quite early in our mm. journey, whereas advice sort of, we used to, I mean, the, we used to all have Dolomite accounts or an equivalent, yep. so that was probably the sort of the first integrate, that now that's gone, and then suddenly people get to an age and they're like, oh, should, you know, this, this advice yep. is a big jump, and it's really interesting, we did a piece of work with Morningstar recently around this escalating consumer trend of I want almost this transactional like early in someone's journey they perhaps want a transactional relationship with an advisor which is quite difficult under the current sort of environment but I want to sort of partake in these apps that you talk about Mm -hmm. and then probably go and foster this relationship and I want to do it together for a period of time when do you introduce advice 
financial concepts, literacy, so that they do become part of someone's world and not yep. this big leap that they've got to make at yep. some stage. Because, yeah, that would be really interesting to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, that's quite um, uh, insightful in terms of um, in terms of that process. And, and uh, we did sort of just touch on this in the panel session. Uh, the answer to that, if we look forward, is that there is no start point. It happens seamlessly. You don't mm. even know you're getting the advice. Precisely. That's at the point where the technology really makes that difference. Uh, and that's happening now already. Uh, so, for example, a lot of people have got the, an app for their super fund and so they get nudges from their super fund in terms of their balance when a deposit's been made. So you're starting to or engage. Or a raise account. You're doing it yourself yeah. without any advice at all. A- and absolutely. That's, you know, not, not ideal. Yeah, so there's lots of platforms which mm. are interacting with our life. Um, that we, you, know, you either have a choice or not a choice, but you know we, we are in a compulsory system in Australia in terms of our superannuation. Yeah. And so that is the base. And then you look at our digital life in a cashless economy. We're almost there. It's not completely cashless, but yeah, you know, we're as close as we've ever been. And you know, by 2030, maybe we are, maybe we're not. But this seamlessness around it means that no one's getting advice anymore. It's just part of every day. Right now, the old system, which has got a great and bright future, which is that at some point in my life, I feel I have enough of um, complexity, yeah, complexity and financial status or well-being. Uh, you know, I've saved enough money, perhaps, or I've got a large super balance. Where I go and see someone, I make a conscious decision. I ring up, make an appointment. You know, in three weeks' time, we'll go and spend an hour and a half, and that'll be our first appointment. And you know, there's this whole sort of very long, detailed complex. It's very hard for people to begin that journey. And it usually happens a little bit later in life, post 30 or 40, roughly speaking, right? It's not an absolute. Yeah, what I'm talking about is introducing systems and platforms and technology to assist humans in having that happen every day for them in the background seamlessly and then the nudges come forward. Yeah, I, th- I feel like a lot of the time the consumer expectation is, I don't have enough to go to a financial planner yet. I don't have enough yeah. to go to... And then all of a sudden, we think we've got enough and now we're going to go. And, yeah. and so to be able to yeah. provide that that experience on the way through, I think is really important. Mm. Um, I think it's really important to be able to make those minuscule steps. And and to some of your points before, if you look back where we were 15, you know, 10 years ago, mm. it's we've come a long way. Absolutely. Yeah, we've come a long way. Yeah. And so it's exciting to yeah. think about what the future could be. Yeah, I did a lot of presentations over the last uh, two decades uh, around change and looking at technology and technology change and all those sort of things. And I look back and I almost laugh at some of those early presentations talking about, uh, you know, booking um, booking a hotel on the telephone, you know, and, and just reminding people that the first real smartphone, the iPhone, was only 2007. Oh, my God, that's just like yesterday. And so we've come a long, long way, but, but it's big leaps forward. So there's periods where we just sort of, Everyone argues and debates over whether we will or won't, and then it just happens. And no one talks about it anymore because it's just part of your ordinary life. Yeah. You know, people talk about EVs, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to get one or I'm going to get one or all. It's not going to happen. Or I say to them, suddenly they stop producing any other car. And he's spot on. (laughs) The decision's made for you. Yes. You've got a bike or you've got an EV. (laughs) Yeah, and suddenly they're just everywhere, right? Uh, And there's lots of evidence through history. I, I, I love this, this great image of uh, New York City in 19, I think it was 1911, and it's about 95% horses, you know, there's horse poo and carriages, and Mm. it's a beautiful old photo, and there's two cars, you can just see these two old cars just sitting in there, and then there's another photo, which is 1921, and it's all cars, and there's two horses, and you think, oh my God, and it can happen to you really fast, and I think that's, in a sense, what we're talking about here today, that this 2020 vision, people need to open up their imagination to what it can be and what it will be. What excites you the most out of that 2030 vision? Like, what do you, what do you go that and or that you could share with the listeners and go, look, we're really excited about this. You've obviously got a more integrated model than an advisor might have, but what might you share with advisors yeah. to go, this is the thing you should really jump on and piggyback on? Yeah, what, what really excites me about that vision of 2030 is that people have got back control of their awesome. own data and their own financial well-being. Financial well-being is, and the reason I say that is because financial well-being is not about how much you've got, it's about understanding what to do the best with what you've got. Um, you know, we've all heard the stories that you know somebody on a very low income is the happiest person in the world and they're financially really secure, and somebody who earns many, many multiples more is very unhappy and they're dead broke. Mm-hmm. And so really this is about democratisation and empowering people, and technology can deliver that because it gives you back your information and gives it back to you in a form that makes sense 
Because right now we have too much, too much information. Right now I couldn't tell you, you know, all... You ask me stuff about my own financial. I, I, I'd be got, are you saying you got too much money, Bernie? Is that what you saying? <laughs> no, I've got, I don't <laughs> know. Where, I don't know where's where and what's what. There's just so much. But but when I use the platform, it gives me visual snapshots. It yeah. tells me on a day to day basis. It's like looking at your banking app, and you go straight to your account summary, and you go, oh, okay, yeah, I know where I'm at mm. today. I know, you know, it's all cut those through di- to the important things that you yeah. actually need to know, yeah. rather than the haze yes. of. So, so that, that's what's exciting. That, that is mm. exciting. I love the I love the fact of bringing the world, the emotional world, and the and the, yes. and the logical world together, and and, mm. to, and giving people control because they can see and visually understand where everything's at. Bernie, thank you so much for, for dropping by the podcast uh, bar. Uh, here at the Congress. I uh, really appreciate you uh, dropping your insights from your amazing session this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Absolute Bernie. pleasure. Thanks, Sam.